So the pointer is the essential thing you need to build a CPU. And with that, you can actually build a CPU and get your instructions from memory because you can point to them. You can get your data because you can point to them. But if you've got something else, you can, you can be really clever. You can build things that are quite cool. And the other thing is this idea of a subroutine. Let's just think about what a program is. A program is a set of instructions that are going to execute or a routine for doing something. So you, your routine is just the instructions you're going to execute to do something. That might be to, say, calculate Fibonacci. It might be to add numbers together. It might be to sort of play the latest game. And you could write that as just one long sequence of instructions, perhaps with the odd loop that would jump back and so on. And you could do that in assembly, in C, in Java, in C Sharp, in Objective-C, whatever language you want to choose, certainly of a procedural object of your sort, and write your whole program out in one go. But if that's all you've got, your program becomes long. Um, you might be able to jump between different points, which can help, but you often find you're writing the same bit of code time and time again. So let's say you want to just print a character out, and that might be done on some machines by writing to a certain location in memory. You use a pointer and write to it. Now, if you have to write that code lots and lots of times, you're going to get pretty bored of writing it. It's going to be the same thing, so it's boring to write. Chances are you typing the same code again, you're going to get bored of writing it, so you're more likely to make a mistake, so you're more likely to introduce bugs, and so it doesn't work. So the way we do a loop in um, Assembler is we say jump to this location, and we jump back to a different point, and it'll execute the same bits of code time and again in a loop. The pointer, it says go to this point, and we add an offset or remove an offset, and we jump back to that point, or we set it to an exact value, it doesn't matter which, depending on the machine. So we can create loops. And we can also jump to other bits of code. Now, the idea of the subroutine is when you want to do something, say, like print a character, rather than writing it many times, you write it once, and you put it somewhere in memory, and you know the address of where it is, or you have something that points to it, the address. And then whenever you want to print something, rather than putting the code in again, you just put in the instruction that says jump to that part of the code that prints something out. And so you have your main routine, which is, say, doing whatever it is you want to do. And then you have lots of these sub-routines or smaller routines that are going to do parts of it that you just jump to when you need to print a character or read a character or access the floppy disk or whatever it is you want to do, update your OpenGL game. So you just jump to these sub-routines. Oh, and then you've got an interesting problem. How do you get back? from that subroutine, because you could, you could say, well, okay, I'll get to the end of the instructions, and I just say, well, okay, I've got here, how do I get back? Well, it's easy, the first one, so I'll just jump back to the next instruction. But then you call it again, and you end up, and you jump back up to the wrong place. So how do you get around that issue, that how do you know where to get back to? Can I try and guess? Go on, let me try and guess. So in the subroutine, do you write in, look at such and such a register as to see where to go back to? So that's one way, but what do you need to do first? Uh, Initialise that. Register. Yeah. So you say, okay, I'm going to jump from the main routine to the subroutine. Now you can't just use a normal jump there because that doesn't remember where you've got to go back to. So you have a special type of jump, which as well as jumping, also memorizes the address or a pointer to the next instruction. Now, just as you said, if you've got something like an ARM chip in something like the Archimedes or the Raspberry Pi, then that will store that return address, as it's called, in another register. So it'll copy it where it's got to go to into another register, you execute that code, and then you just set the instruction pointer or the program counter to have the same value that's in that other register, and jump your back and you carry on executing there. So you build your CPU to allow that. Now there's problems with that, because if you want to implement something like recursion, you have a function which calls a subroutine, and then that subroutine is going to call itself. So if you do that, you lose the original bit of code, is that right? Well, you lose the original return address. So, so straight away we've gone into a never-ending loop? You've gone into a never-ending loop, or so it gets messy and the program crashes and things go wrong. What most CPUs do, or on something like the ARM you implement yourself, because it's the way the ARM chip works, and that's fine, is you store that um, return address in memory via a pointer. So rather than having a register that contains the return address, you can have a register, and it's usually done on the stack using the stack pointer, that actually points to somewhere in memory where you store that return address. And then when you get another one, you can move on to another bit of memory and store that on there, and then you can wind back up your stack 
to get the return addresses. If I remember Professor Brailsford's video well enough, the last thing on the stack is the first kind of place you go to, yeah. then that would kind of come off the stack, pop off the stack, yeah. I'm remembering it now. Yeah, that's right. Um, and pop off the stack and then it'll, it'll give you access to where the next yeah. pointer is. So if you think about it, you sort of think, you can imagine it's piling pieces of paper on top of each other, post-it notes, you take the top post-it note off and then it tells you to go back and the next time it takes you and so until you end up with the one that gets you back into the main routine. So some CPUs, like the x86 family that started off with the 8088, will do that automatically so that when you make that special jump to the subroutine, they will store the return address on the stack for you. Others, like the ARM chip, require you to do, will store it in a register and then you have to put it on the stack if you want to do it. It's just the architecture, it's horses for courses, it doesn't make any real difference. So that's depending on how many instructions the instructions yeah, have it's, it's, it's just it's just the design. You think, well actually, you're making your chips more complex by automating that, whereas actually if we just let the program do it, because sometimes you don't need to do that. So you can make your program faster with those leaf subroutines as they tend to be known. And so once you've got that technology, either part via software or part via the hardware, and you can move it between the two as much as you like, then you can use the subroutine to make the code easy to write, and from that you can build functions in C, procedures, methods in objects are all implement in an object oriented language are all implemented in that way. They're using that idea of the subroutine. So when you call them, they store the return address and execute the code and then they have some mechanism to get back from that return address to what get back from the end of the subroutine via the return address to where you carry on. Now the clever thing is how they originally came up with that idea because the original CPU, something like EDSAC back in the late 40s, early 50s, didn't support subroutines in hardware and yet a chap called David Wheeler was able to create what was called the Wheeler jump which he used to implement the very first subroutines. Now this is really clever but absolutely nightmarish and I should put up a disclaimer do not try this at home because it used what's called self-modifying code. So let's get rid of that. So let's use some sort of pseudo arm code and we've got some instructions that are going off and then we're going to jump to a subroutine, we'll call it sub and then we're going to carry on here. And then so we'd have our subroutine somewhere off in memory and it would have the instructions it would need to execute and then at some point you're going to get to a point here where you're going to return. That's the way most things are structured. Now we had jumps and things on EDSAC but that's all we had. So we could have a jump here that would get back. So we'd have a branch here that would say branch and let's just give it a label back. But we don't know where back is because we don't know that until we actually call it. So if we know where the subroutine is and because when we write the code we know how many instructions there are here, we can work out where in memory this branch back instruction is going to be, branch to back. And so this is where the clever bit happens. What David Wheeler did was say okay before we make this branch or jump to the subroutine we're going to put in instructions here which, and we're using some really clunky pseudocode, modify jump back. So you had code that modified itself as it was running and it would alter this instruction to remove back there and put in, let's just call it return and modified that to be return. And then a bit later on we'd call it again, so we'd modify the jump here modify jump back, call the subroutine, we branch to it, and then we would carry on here. And we'd call this, let's call it Fred, and so we'd replace return here with the address of Fred. So that's now pointing to Fred, so that when the subroutine's called, it executes and then jumps back to the right place. So as long as you've got the ability to jump to an address in your CPU and the ability to modify memory by monkeying around using a pointer, you could implement a subroutine even though the CPU didn't have any support for it. Now, this is what's called self-modifying code because as the program is running, it is changing itself as it is running. If you get this wrong, the program crashes and bad things happen, so that's not something you want to do for the of heart, which is why this technology is then moved into the CPU and implemented in hardware for the same reason. It's something that we're going to do a lot of, so we let it be implemented once and we reuse it in the same way that we going to do lots of things in our program so we make a subroutine to do that and rather this is so common we put it into the hardware because we're going to use it or at least some sort of hardware support 
grid. And of course, the way modern CPUs have got with caches and things in there, self-modifying code doesn't work properly anyway because they're not true von Neumann machines. Based on my pre-trained network, I'm going to produce 5,000 characters of random text. And let's see what it looks like. Uh, so it'll just boot up for a minute and then it will run. It's pretty quick once it gets going. There we go. So you can see we've got comments, we've got replies. At first glance, it looks plausible. When you actually read into the comments, they're very bizarre. So this guy by Blorkythrop, now that might be a real person.